morning, everybody. Um, so glad you're here. Okay. From our darling um, Evie White with Charlotte's Web. Because it, yeah, it's a little dark. Why did you do all this for me? He asked. I don't deserve it. I've never done anything for you. You have been my friend, replied Charlotte. That in itself is a tremendous thing. Can you just pick out a nice, simple name for me? Something not too long, not too fancy, not too dumb?
Think of the books on your shelf that are well worn versus the ones that you can see in perfect condition that are never read. The difference is voice. Be yourself. Above all, let who you are, what you are, what you believe in shine through every sentence you write, every piece you finish. Um, so we drew the genie from Aladdin because he's always telling Aladdin to be himself, to not, you know, between are you going to be the street writer or are you going to be this great prince? And it's always more important. We're always telling our kids, you know, be yourself, don't be anybody else. Um, and so that's really important in any writing piece they do, whether it's informational, personal narrative, is just write what you know about and who you are and then hopefully the rest will fall into place. The quote is, as a writer you're obligated to draw readers into your world and if your writing isn't interesting to them you won't succeed. And we thought this was pretty much the purpose of writing. You're using all those elements to create a story that's going to draw people in and then we said without a reader there is no writing. So um, right now, Deb and I are feeling pretty confident about what we have planned for you because many of your questions and comments are the things that we're going to talk about today. So we really appreciate your conversation around this. Um, I'm feeling pretty good about this. I think it's going to be okay today. Okay. So kind of sum up what you have said and what you um, say in the quotes. You said it's the writer coming through the words. It's the personality of the author personality of the author. Um, you can see that the writer is engaged personally with the topic. And the writer imparts a personal flavor that is unique to him or to her. So let's delve into this a little more. So when we're talking about voice, what is it specifically that we are teaching? Putting energy into the writing, and that came over there with number five. And we're teaching kids how to put energy into the writing. And we're just not going to tell you what we're teaching. We're going to delve in and look at lessons that do this um, with, with uh, crafting nonfiction. We want students to be able to recognize voice. So we need to be very explicit with that and show them examples and talk about it over and over and over and over and over. Um, this, going back to number three, selecting, and it was with several of the quotes, Selecting personally important topics. Sometimes we're going to tell students what the mode is, but we want them to have some type of choice because once they have that, it's something that's interesting um, to them. They're going to go for it and they're going to write. Um, for the Prairie Lane people, they know my son only wrote about soccer. His whole elementary career, only soccer in all the different modes. And that came up when we talked about it at conferences. And so I, I've done some research and let him. That's fine. I mean, he's, he's writing. And once we try to get students to write about something that they don't want to write about, then they, they tend to um, shut down. However, there are times when they do have to write um, something that we tell them to write. And then we just have to support them as much as we can and give them a lot of praise but they're still in charge of that. Connecting to an audience, and that came over, came through in several places, they have to have an audience. Otherwise, why does voice matter? And the purpose of writing, without a reader, there is no writing. So when do we know voice emerges? It's when the author is speaking directly to the reader. And this can get, at, at the elementary level, at second grade, this is kind of literal, and then as a, adults, we kind of see it differently. We feel as we're reading our the books that you know, we have time that we read before we go to bed or whatever, they, we can sense that the reader's talking to us without literally talking to us. But you have an example of what, um, what grade is that? I think it's the fourth grade talking right to us. Imagine if there was only cats, terrible, right? Now imagine if there was only dogs, awesome, right? Dogs are way better than cats. That's what I will be telling you today. A lot of reasons. Okay, so there's the voice coming. Is attempting to speak directly to the reader. Is attempting to voice right there. Another thing, um, you know, voice is emerging when the writer is as kind of doing different styles. Is experimenting. So I was thinking about that. Um, hmm. That lady that broke into Henry Dorley Zoo. <laughs> and uh, she wanted to pet a tiger, which, uh, whatever. But so that made me think 
of a sign that I might see in the zoo. So you see the sign, please do not feed the animals. So if we were playing around with style, we might see something like this. Please be safe. Do not stay on the safe climb or lean on zoo fences. If you fall, animals can eat you and that might make them sick. Thank you. <laughs> so here's another one. Please do not drop your cigarette butts on the ground. The fish crawl out at night to smoke them and we're trying to get them to quit. <laughs> and I was thinking about that because we, we respond to that. Obviously the author, you think about who wrote this, their, their purpose was to make you laugh but also to make you not uh, drop your cigarette butts. And if I read this, I'd be more likely not to drop my <coughs> cigarette butt than if I had some, if I saw the sign, do, do not smoke or so. Um, wear your seatbelt, it's the law. And everything, it's just like, yeah, they're so straightforward. It just kind of ticks me off a little bit, almost to where I want to take off my seatbelt. But I got into um, Missouri and they, it was kind of cute the way they had their signs that said, oh, you look really nice in that seatbelt. Um, it's not it's not a trick, wear your seatbelt, it's a treat. You know, those type of things. Just your, playing around with style can have a different effect on your audience. And here's the last one. Those who throw objects at the crocodiles will be asked to retrieve them. So just playing around with that style. And then taking risks by revealing the person behind the words. And Randy's going to talk about uh, one of my favorite authors, Stephen King, and what he says about taking the risks and experimenting with style. So as you said when we were talking around about these posters, um, voice is challenging to teach, and voice is something that develops in our kids over time. I can't just go to you and say, your paper needs a good voice, put it in. I can go to you and say, you could work on some vivid verbs. That's a really concrete thing, and I can give it to you, and you can work on it. But voice takes a lot more work on our part, and it takes a lot more work on kids' parts. But I was thinking about, um, used to do a lot of state writing scoring, they are playing with style in a way that, but the more I read about that, that's how they're playing with it. And so it gets like overblown and too much before that it evens out into a more mature style. But I love this because he, Stephen King was talking about that. And he says, um, oh, this is from The Nine Rights of Every Writer. It's a Vicki Spandell. It's pretty funny. Deb and I do a lot of reading to get ready for you because we want to build that background. This is from um, Stephen King. When I read Ray Bradbury as a kid, I wrote like Ray Bradbury. Everything green and wondrous and seen through a lens smeared with the grease of his nostalgia. When I read James N. Payne, everything I wrote came out clipped and stripped and hard boiled. When I read Lovecraft, my prose became luxurious and Byzantine. I wrote stories in my teenage years where all these styles merge, creating a kind of hilarious stew. That's what our kids do. They try these things out, and sometimes we listen to it or read it and kind of cringe. That's a step on the development of voice in a writer, is to try out things. So you may have seen your kids where, you, where they're trying to add voice and they put 17 exclamation points, and it's driving us nuts, but it's a really a part of their process of learning about voice, and it feels like lots of kids have to do too much before they get to sort of a nice blend of voice. And that is very developmental um, at this age, is where they learn something, they'll see from a book that you know David Shannon used an exclamation point in words, and so they'll try it. Well, good for them. Um, and we may cringe because they keep doing it, but eventually we show them other ways, and they'll <coughs> start to that and use it um, <coughs> So voice is everywhere, and to, to make it more concrete, as we think about in writing, it, it, it's more abstract. So if we think about artwork, who's the artist, everyone? And I guarantee you I could put up anything that he has um, painted and he would know it was Van Gogh. So we have different topics and we have his self-portrait, we have Starry Night, we have his bedroom, um, and so forth, the wheat fields. So we have different topics but if we look, what is he doing? His in, his individuality, his personality is coming through. So I'm thinking, I could be writing something that's dark, um, and I could be, or I could be writing something that is happy and jovial, <coughs> but Deb Cruz is still gonna come through. My personality is still gonna come through. Um, and that's what we see in painting, and that's one way to look at it. So you, you know, 
what, what does Van Gogh do um, that we know it's Van Gogh? Same with this artist. Escher. Escher. And so what does he do that we know, if I was to pull up another one that you know it's Escher? Pattern, tessellations, that type of thing. Um, you know, the staircase, it's just so odd, it's like you can't figure out where it's going. It's, it's that illusion type thing. Dolly. And, you know, everything's melty and surreal, and, and it just, it, but they all have that distinctive Dolly. There's no other Dolly. There's no other Van Gogh. Um, we could try to emulate him. Interesting, because as, as uh, Deb and I and Shannon have talked so much about voice, the more we talk about it and pay attention to it, the more we see it. And um, so in reading the newspaper, and I don't read a lot of sports, but I thought, well, this, there's not going to be voice on the sports page. Oh my gosh, there's so much voice on the sports page. It helps that the Royals won. So um, <laughs> it's something to be really passionate about. But once we start paying attention to it, it's everywhere. And once we pay attention to it with our kids, they will begin to see it. Because that was one of the things that we, as we talked around here, was that um, we can't find it, kids can't find it, maybe it doesn't need to be there. And it's one of those things that gets better because we pay attention to it and begin to notice it. Passionate, and I'm not going to say a whole lot more, but 
he, he, you're, you're going to find that he has voice. What did he do to create that voice? Or think about it like this. What does he always do in all, what does he do in all his books that's consistent that you would pick this up and say, oh yeah, this is Seymour Simon. Simon. We have Gail Gibbons, who also does informational. What makes Gail Gibbons, Gail Gibbons, what makes her different from Seymour Simon? They both have unique voice. So what is it? And, and can we pinpoint that? And that's where some of these traits are going to mesh. You're going to say, well, part of the style of this author might be um, the layout. This author always does this. Um, one might, if word choice might be something that that person does. So kind of be thinking all, um, through all of those ideas as we go into this next section where you're going to look at mention text. And what we try to do is give you um, at least two books with the same author so you can look across and see consistently what that author's doing. So I think we have enough to do the three is that two the voice in here. And would this be a good example that I would want to use to teach my students voice? Okay, and so I just collected some books and I'm coming back to our comments as we started today. It was such a great beginning. It, it, it is challenging to find nonfiction with voice, and we want you to, to discover more books. Because as you know, the beginning of every point you end up before you actually start the teaching, you're doing that immersion piece where you're finding lots and lots of whatever the mode is that they're writing. We, we allow to we go above their grade level. So we're making more difficult text. So, and that's, an, and that's our purpose. So when you see books, they might not be what your students can be independently, but read, read allows, that's what read allows them for. About voice and great text to talking about voice in our students' papers. So as we look at the three, which is our target, and um, as we see in all those other sections of the rubric, three talks about generally expressive generally appropriate for the purpose of an audience, generally specific, precise, and varied. So it doesn't have to be everything all the time, um, but they're on their way to thinking about voice. And we talked about this, that voice develops. Um, so as we look at these papers, I think for me, um, we see that, that overuse sometimes, I think it fits in voice is generally appropriate. So if I think about that, when they're writing in that sort of overly silly way, their audience is probably their peers or themselves, and maybe it is appropriate for that audience. Um, but we do think kids do developmentally go through that, that phase where they're kind of overusing it. So it's something to think about. So what you're going to do at your tables is just take a look at um, the voice rubric and the two texts and talk about... Um, we are now gonna do two file sorts. And I need to do is do these kids have voice or do they not? Are they weaker than strong or stronger than weak? So just think, all right, so we've looked at examples. But here is the million dollar question. So, so how do you teach it? Because voice is so tricky. And um, <coughs> like she, uh, I'm sorry, the brand new thing earlier, you can't just go over your about um, voice in these texts, reading aloud to our kids is really our first step. And so, again, fits well with our point units where every unit starts with that immersion piece. Um, and now we've gotten a chance to share with each other some great texts for teaching voice in nonfiction. Um, and I think if, if you're like me, my, my awareness is going to be raised and I'll be looking for it more and finding it more. Um, so reading to them is the key to getting them started on that journey. So as we come back to Charlotte's Web, um, sometimes when we hear voice, we can hear some very spe spe specific, and say, some very specific things, and other times it's more generalized. So if you think about Charlotte's Web, um, could you describe the person behind the voice? And a lot of you have been having these conversations about dialogue. In Charlotte, it's the dialogue that reveals, there's so much dialogue, but it reveals the personality. And when you're reading a book, you're not thinking about what the author was doing, you're thinking about how great the book is. But think about 
all the things that she does to develop those personalities, that kind of um, down to business that Charlotte has and that kind of frazzled, going to fall apart at the seams that um, our kid does. So um, can you tell what she plays or where the author's from? In books like this, that might matter in other books. And I don't, I, I guess it's just because I've been reading a little bit of Southern fiction, but like the South is so, like if, if the book's about the South or the writers from the South, it, feel, it feels like I can hear that all the time. Even in the nonfiction stuff, there's just a definite voice and a whole culture around that. Um, how would you describe this text? So just take a minute, and on your tables you have a little half sheet, looks like this. Um, this might be helpful to you and to your students, because as second graders, sometimes they don't have the vocabulary to describe the voice. Like, it makes me feel happy, it makes me feel sad, it makes me mad. Um, but we can teach kids about other kind of vocabulary. So take a look at those and think about the voice you hear in Charlotte. How would you describe that? What these words? Just talk about it with the folks at your table. Our discussion just around these words, and I think several people are looking the words up, and I get that. So maybe this is a, word, a list that you would um, add to or take away from to use with your students. Some of the vocabulary may be above them, but if you think about the subtleties of text, um, for them to have some descriptors and to be able to describe what is going on, what is my feeling, and then for us to show them what that author does to create that feeling. So we're talking about Charlotte. Sometimes she's kind of bossy, she's always kind. Sometimes she's a little like short-tempered with, with, with the pig because he, he, he just like, it's gonna fall apart. Um, so building on kids' vocabulary can help them to begin to recognize that. Um, as they work on their writing. And I'm going to say something too. Also, as we're here, we're teaching you as adult learners also about voice. So um, we want to <coughs> understand what it, what it is at an adult level and then decide how to scaffold it down for a second grader. So we want to keep that in mind too with our special development. We want to be the experts in voice. We're, we have to be the experts if we're going to be teaching it to students. So yes, we understand some of these words are, are not going to be words that would expect any second grader to um, use. It's just to kind of get us understanding, and then we would put words in that um, would be more applicable to <coughs> So that whole read aloud piece is the link that we're going to use to as we um, move on to the question that many of you ask about what is guided writing. Um, so I'm taking you back to the balanced literacy model because the read aloud piece, that's that umbrella that supports all of our literacy learning, more than just literacy learning. Um, and we're reading aloud to kids from genres that they might not choose themselves. That's why I was so happy that a lot of you found authors today that you didn't know very well that you said, I'm going to go back to. Didn't know Seymour Simon, I'm going to use him. Didn't know Gail Gibbons, I'm going to use her. That's what we're doing for our kids. If you've got a kid that's reading nothing but Magic Schoolhouse, and you introduce them to Seymour Simon, they may be hooked. Because kids tend, especially second graders, I think, they love to get into a series and read every book in the series. But we can maybe steer them towards a nonfiction series. But it's that reading, that, that's the umbrella, that, that's the glue that holds all this literacy learning together. So that's where we can provide that language, that immersion in language. So if you think about that balanced literacy model and then look to the writing part, um, guided writing fits in there and it's a part of our, of our model. So in thinking about this, I want just to make sure and to double check with my um, ideas about guided writing. So I looked at a lot of professional authors. So of course, I started with Hoyt. She said it's a highly focused, small group writing experience. Um, it's a scaffold to support learners in the psychologically <coughs> difficult activity of writing, which I like this. So sometimes our writing conferences or writing guided writing groups are about instilling confidence. They may not be about a skill or a strategy, but they're just that little attaboy, like, look at what you're doing here, and now you can do that. So I love that reference to the psychologically difficult activity. Difficult activity. Um, a small group, instructional framework, designed to give children who share. So all of these authors kind of come across with the same idea, that as you looked at your piles of papers, and you looked at your weaker than strong pile, you probably saw groups of kids that had similar needs. Like maybe they had great steps in their procedural 
but their introduction was super weak. So you had three or four of those kids, you can bring them together and reteach the chunk about what an introduction to a procedural text looks like. Or their closure is weak. They get done and they say, the end. You could bring those kids together. Or maybe they're just, um, their writing is kind of uh, ho-hum, like they need a little more work than adjectives or verbs or something like that. You're gonna bring those kids together. And for us as teachers, it's a way of being efficient with our time. I got three kids that need a similar thing. So it's going to look different than from a writing conference. We talked about last time doing our best to try to let the kids set the agenda. In a guided writing group, you're going to be the agenda setter because you see a need with kids. But the rest of it looks very much like um, guided reading or can be compared to um, preparing. So you have to know your kids. Just what you did and all the details that you found, how they spent, more to go. You, you were able to spend because you were here and you had to. More time looking at these texts and analyzing them than you may have time for in, for in your own classroom. But understanding what it is that they need is huge. Um, and that's the only way they're going to be able to um, put together a value writing group. So um, you're thinking about what it is that they need. And again, I think to me that I read that across so that shot in the arm idea. Like they're kind of lagging. You know, a lot of kids are really enthusiastic when you start a new mode and then they kind of stay. So it can be a way of just kind of pumping them up and getting them going. Um, they don't take the place of the writing workshop. So we're still doing our whole class mini lesson. We're still having that middle chunk of time where kids are writing and we're conferring with, with kids or pulling small groups. Um, it's, not, it's not different, it's a part of. Again, notes are essential. And I love this one because I think, and as I never mentioned this, I know I often don't talk enough about high progress kids that need to be pushed. This is the place where you can push your high progress kids because I, I always focus too much on our low progress kids um, and the support they need. So as we were talking about the text here, and some of these texts you said, well, I wouldn't use this for my whole class because of the complex sentence structure. But maybe for that guided writing group of kids who are ready to move on, maybe that complex sentence structure would be a great fit for those kids, but not for your whole class. Um, so the steps are pretty much the same as the steps for designing a, uh, a conference or designing a guided reading group. You're going to put together a mini lesson. It may be exactly the same mini lesson as you did with your class. Maybe you have a group of low progress readers and writers, readers, writers, they have to go together, and you lose them in whole class lessons. You can pull them together so that they can have more opportunities to respond and more interaction with you. Um, so a mini lesson. You're going to talk about the behavior or the strategic action that's necessary, and it might mean that you go back to that anchor chart that you made with your class. And you've seen that in your classrooms. There are kids who use that anchor chart all the time. They're constantly referring to it. And there are kids for whom that chart is like wallpaper. They don't even notice it. They don't see it at all. So calling your attention back to that. Um, or maybe you create a new one together. Maybe it's more complex than the one you made for the class. Or maybe it's more simplistic than the one that you made for the class. Um, but you're going to use your time based on what those kids need. And you're going to be the most expedient with that. So um, they get to try it. You're going to model one, they're going to try one, and then you're going to send them on their merry way with the hopes that they'll apply that in their future writing. So this is a good link where we talked last time about conferring, where we're trying to the best of our ability to keep our hands out of kids' papers. We're showing them what it is that strong writers do, but when they go back to their seat, they may ignore everything that we said. They may not be ready for what we said to them. So that's the piece, and I hear lots of people talking about the number of pieces that you're trying to deal with as a teacher. And we know that if we, it's hard, but if we stay out of that conferring piece, if we stay out of that independent piece, then we can use a piece that we've worked on together because we know that not all kids are going to apply. If I say, Jill fix all your periods, well then I'm totally in hers. But if, I, but if we have a conversation about how periods work, I show her how to practice a few, and I say, I'd like you to go back to your seat and check and see if there's some more periods. Well, she may not do that. So um, that, that lesson design is really similar to lots of other lessons. So one way to think about it is just to compare it to the writing conference, because the steps are all the same, except the grouping part. The research that we do in a writing conference is talking to kids. So, Telly, what is it they've been working on? I noticed that 
you were trying to use ellipses because you saw them in a story or whatever, whatever. That research is different than the research that you do for guided writing because this time I'm doing a research with their work and I'm saying, this child, this child, this child, and this child all could use some extra opportunity with whatever strategy it is. The rest of it is the same. You teach, you keep record of what, what they're doing. Sometimes you bring those kids together for several days in a row. Often it's just one day. It's really dependent on the needs of the student. Um, so you have a great support for making decisions about guided writing, and that is your crafting nonfiction book. So I'm going to ask you to go to just one section. There's lots of sections, but just go to the voice section and spend some time looking at those lessons and thinking about your students. What would they need? What could I provide from this book? And know that point instead can't give you all the lessons that you need. They give you lessons that lots of kids need, but you're still going to be designing them. <laughs> Um, there's so much in there, but we're asking you just to look at voice today since that is our um, trade for the day. And know that not every lesson you need is going to be in that book, but they are jumping off places. One thing I noticed today that I hadn't noticed before was how well those lessons fit with those mentor texts that we were talking about. Um, when they talk about uh, choose a great engaging title. Um, and so we, we're building our knowledge of those mentor texts and, and then you can bring that mentor text to that small group lesson and of course not read the whole thing but maybe just show them where the author did what you'd like them to do. So I'm loving those connections that we're able to make in that way. So if writers are um, going to have voice, pardon me? Oh yes. Okay, so your um, teacher manual, I just want you to realize, and Linda Hoyt says it, and Tony said it in several places in your um, teacher manual, that they don't know your students, and they just try to put together a framework of lessons, like 10 sessions, uh, to teach a mode. They have no idea what your kids know, but you do. So you um, may see that, okay, it's gonna take two or three days of modeling researching. And the crafting nonfiction has great lessons to do so. You may see there's a there's a little gap between session one and session two, or session two and session three. So stop and fill that gap. Use your professional judgment of what you need to do. Because I think that's where, you know, if we're going page by page, we're, we're finding that our students aren't being successful. So we have to step back and say, well, what did we miss? Um, and that's what the authors want you to do. They want you to step back and think, what do, what do my students need? And that's what this is all about, is truly knowing our students. And if you have to hear from the manual and dig into crafting nonfiction, go for it. Um, if you have to take out a lesson and replace it with another, do, do it. Um, just, just keep that in mind as you're, as you're planning. So in order to teach voice, kids have to have an audience. Back to that tab again. They have to have a topic, they have to have an audience, and they have to have a purpose. And we talked in the last session how many kids are writing for us. They're writing for great. They're writing to make us happy. And so we need to be very deliberate in making sure that they know their audience. And one of the ways that um, we do that is through the um, writing workshop model. So. Um, Thank you. <laughs> about that model, if you've heard me speak before, I like to think about the time for reading or writing as a kind of a diamond shape. And our mini lesson is here, and yes, indeed, some less mini lessons in point border on maxi lessons, I get that. And that middle section is where kids are working and we're conferring with them or reading with them. And then that end section is the share time. And that end section, just, we run out of time a lot for it. So we wanted to focus on that today, um, that sharing and reflecting. And one of the reasons that portion is so important is it gives our kids a real audience, their classmates, to their stories. And their classmates will ask for more information, will give them affirmations, may help them check. But it's a, re it's a teaching time for us, that bottom part of the workshop, to share. 
So um, we want to share with you some ideas for that share time to make it super productive. It's a teaching time. It's not a kids read their story time necessarily, although they re may read portions. So when you do that, they get a response from here. They get to hear their story. And I know you guys are going to do this. They're reading their story and they're all talking to them. Oh, wait a minute. And they're fixing something because they're hearing it differently because they're presenting it to one of their peers and they hear something that they left out or something, see something they want to change. So it's so important. And they learn from each other. They talk to each other. Um, on mine, I did this. You'll see I'm holding their papers together and talking about um, I did this, I did that. So um, it has an important place in that workshop. And a great thing for you to talk about at your writing PLC if you're building is how do you make time for that? Um, when I was teaching second grade, I, I set a timer. Now, sometimes I turned the timer off and I didn't do share, because like I was in the middle of something, we were all in the middle of something. But otherwise, I can't remember to stop five minutes early. It's just really hard when you're in that process. So that'd be a good thing to share, is how do other people make time for that share? How do you just make that fit in there? And, and I, I'm saying, I'm gonna challenge the idea that it has to be at the end, because I don't believe it has to be at all that it has to be at the end. It could be right before they start to um, write. They could verbalize, you could give a prompt to them all that, okay, tell your partner, partner B, if you're A, tell B what you're going to um, do today. What is your plan for today? What's your goal for today? But we'll, I'll talk more about that um, as we go through these. So there's different types of sharing that we can do. Um, I know you're, you're doing certain ways. These are just four examples that you could take back into your classroom and do tomorrow. Um, there's a simple share response, a survey share, a focus share, and a student as teacher share. So the first one, the simple share, is, just, is exactly that. It's simple. It's where this child chooses what they want to talk about or maybe something that they want to read from their paper or maybe they want to ask a question. It's totally up to the child. So there would have to be a lot of modeling and practicing what this would look like. But the, the thing about this is maybe it's not something they're reading. Maybe they're just talking about, I struggled so much today with leaves. What did you do? I mean, it's just, it could be just a conversation, but they're having that conversation with each other. Um, so it's not whole group. The, ask, the, the key thing here is that everybody has the chance to share. Every single child has a chance to share. <coughs> the survey share. This is when the teacher decides the topic. So it may be the lead. And you may tell the students today, um, we're going to sit, sit in a circle, and everyone's going to share the first sentence of the lead, the first sentence, or a vivid verb. And it's, there's no talking in between. So if you're sharing the vivid verb, it may almost sound poetic going around. But then the students are hearing 23 different vivid verbs or 23 present tense verbs, or whatever it may be. And um, then you have this part to process at the end. You can say, OK, what did you hear? Now, this is hard. At first, you're going to probably have kids not know how to answer this. But as you do survey shares and talk about this, it's going to, um, it, they're going to understand. And you're going to want to probably prompt that. Do you want to say anything about Sure. sure, I just think that that processing time at the end, um, and also what Deb said, that just, it just puts, whatever it is your focus is, it puts so much of that in the, in the air and it's coming from your students. So they, like she said, they get to hear 23 verbs. They get to hear, and sometimes the noticing is we're all saying good. Oh, well, what could we say? I mean, it's a teaching opportunity for, for us, but um, just as that prompt that we talked about conferring, we thought that would be hard for kids, like, what are you working on, or how's it going? This is another prompt that takes a lot of teaching that goes around it. But again, it's just bringing our teaching back together. And if you think about our lesson design, closure, this is closure. Bringing it back and having kids do the work of what is it that we worked on today. And I apologize. We're just going to watch a portion of this. Um, this is Sarah and
focusing on as I revise is making sure that I remember the steps. But one thing they are using is a seven step, and that's going to um, really help our um, English language learners and also our struggling writers to have a set and step and maybe coach them before to make sure that they know what they're going to say. So you might want to stop and go up to those students and say, okay, so this is what we're going to do in our survey share today. This is our set and step. What are you going to say? And maybe even if they have it written out, but that's a way to support them um, in this process. That sentence also expedites the survey share. It is a quick thing. There is no teacher yak yak between kids. And if they have that sentence stem, it helps them to be succinct. One thing I'm going to work on today is, if they're following your directions, they have a very focused thing that they're going to say. So it also helps focus, and it helps you control the time issue. They're not going to chat sentences and sentences about their story. They're going to do their sentence stem, and you're going to get those marvelous examples from student work there they all get to hear. And in that case, those students will know what to work on when they go back to their papers. They all said it perfectly out loud. The next is the focus share. It's the same thing as the share, except where they're just doing it with a partner. Again, they all are sharing. They're all having the opportunity to share, but it's just not with the entire class. They're doing it with a partner. And they can do several partners. They can walk around and do several partners. But again, it's focused. This is the teacher giving them um, the the focus, whatever it's going to be. Here's what I'd like you to do. Tigers, you're going to go first, and you're going to talk about your feeling. How did you feel? Okay? And um, Yaz, you're also going to talk about your feeling. How did you feel when I said you had to write for five minutes and you could not stop? Uh, Oakdale, you're going to talk about what did you do when you got stuck on an idea and you knew you had to keep writing and you couldn't stop. Okay, start discussing go. I didn't really even have an idea. So I just kept writing and I was really confident about my story, so I just kept writing. Okay, so that question about how did you feel when she said you had writing without stop, yeah. what was your feeling? I felt really good about myself because I knew I had, I had something to write about and it was going to be a good system. Okay, great. Um, so just to, give, to just set you up for this, uh, Deb and Ruby did a session at our last district-wide PD day. Uh, but, and they talked about um, building student stamina. So Michelle took that back to her classroom and wanted to try it with her kids. So she didn't give them any warning. She just said, um, when they came, started their writing, she said, we're going to do something different today. We are going to write five minutes straight with no talking. And you can't stop. You have to write the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and she didn't give them much introduction or anything. And then she just set the timer and said, go. And so they started writing. Um, they did amazingly well with it. But then her question to them was twofold. One, the emotional thing. What does it feel like when you're told you need to write and you can't stop? So they talked about their emotions. Um, and then the second one was the strategy. So when you felt like you were needing to stop but the five minutes wasn't over, what would you do? And I mean, if they were brilliant, some of them said, I just wrote the same word over and over until something came into my brain. Great. Um, they said, well, I, I was thinking about when I told my mom about this and what. And the other thing she found out was because the topic was complete choice, she had tons of kids writing fantasy. And so we've had those discussions today where our modes are pretty, so, and kids don't always have a lot of choice, but that also taught Michelle a lot about her class. Like these kids, when they have half a moment, they want to write fantasy. Let them go, because they had a lot of fun with that. And then she also asked them, how many of you, I love this, this is her, how many of you uh, were able to write the whole time on the same topic? And every kid in the class raised their hand, except Mrs. Van Dyne, who had to change subjects because she couldn't write for five minutes on her own. But, um, but so you can see that how that share is supporting them, and what do we do? And what she's doing is also doing is helping them to understand that, yes, indeed, you can write for extended amounts of time. She picked a really reasonable amount of time, five minutes, and now we're doing it just like you do reading stamina. Well, let's see how far we can go tomorrow. Let's see if we can increase our stamina. Um, and it's also providing an opportunity for them to do writing of their, their own choice. So, it's a fun one. Okay, and going back to that, that whole purpose, is they're sharing with each other, so they're sharing each other's strategies. Everybody has that chance to share out. Everybody does. And then they're hearing, oh, well, you did that, maybe I'll do that. We'll next time. And so, another type of share is student as the teacher share. And 
and this is where um, the teacher is conferencing with the students. And you may notice that uh, Caroline had a great lead, and you really want to use that as an example um, for the rest for the rest of the class. Or maybe mark the her use of adjectives or verbs really strengthened her piece. So you're kind of choosing what you want the rest of the class to hear. And um, you're going to pick uh, three or four students to, you're going to ask them if they're willing to do it, and they'll share at the end. So it's not recommended to do daily because we want every student to share out every day. But then this this also allows, um, well, can you go ahead and talk about what you, you have said? Sure. Previous yeah. Um, and one thing about this student is teacher share is not random. So we talk about pulling sticks so that everybody's on board. This is not a pulling stick time. This is, you know there's a great example that you would like your whole class to hear, and so you designate that person. But what I love about this is that, let's say that I'm um, having a guided writing group with these three little writers. They might not be the strongest writers in my class, but we're having a discussion around whatever it is. I know what they have on their paper. I know that they've improved whatever the focus is. So I know that their share is gonna be successful and that they're going to get kudos from their classroom for that. So I love that idea that, that the teacher is making that choice because sometimes we're, just by the nature of kids' different abilities, the same kids get recognized over and over and over again. So if you're supporting those second language learners or you have your ELL teacher with you, she would know and she would be my partner in this to say, you know what, the four of us just worked on this today and I think this would be a great student as teacher share. So we can highlight the work and also, I mean, just pump them up. Pump them up too. Oh, look, I did this. I got recognition from my class. Now you're going to see an example of a student as teacher share. Okay, earlier during our lesson, we talked about how writers want to add a look to their writing. And when they add a look, that keeps the reader's attention and they want to read on more. But when I was conferencing with you, I read so many great examples of some leads. And so there were a couple that I picked that I'd like them to share out loud, and then we're going to give them a shout out. Okay, so let's. I'm looking forward to finding out ways that I can care for nature because I certainly don't want our earth to end up like Emily described it. I really have that picture in my mind. All right, shout out. Yay! Yeah. All right, Luke, interesting fact. I have no idea that high of a percentage. Definitely something that I want to do about that. All right, shout out. Yay! Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amy, she was very purposeful. She chose students that used a different um, type of lead in the one she taught so the students had um, where you could see different ways to start um, their, their text. So to make this process work for students, they have to know how to talk about writing, so that's where the vocabulary of the traits comes in. So we have to make sure that they have that. And also to define the roles clearly, who's going to be the speaker, who's going to be the listener, who's going to talk first, who's going to talk second, AP, some of you have salt, pepper, ketchup, mustard, whatever it may be. And um, that the listener is, what does that mean? What does that look like to listen? What does that mean to speak? And so forth. Distinguish between peer editing and review. The great thing about these peer shares is they're never handing over their paper. So they do not. And so our struggling writers, our ELL writers, they um, don't have to worry or be self-conscious about their writing. They're just sharing something. It's, it's up to them what they share. They don't have to hand over a paper. Um, we have to teach students how to apologize. I know you've probably heard this in your classroom. Oh, this is bad, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say that. I'm sorry, you know, this is, I mean, they they tend to apologize before they say something they don't think is very good. Also show when you are modeling the process of the sharing. Um, for the first time that you show them what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. And it's important, especially with voice, to have students read the reaction of their audience. And then when you respond to start with the I instead of you, and like the I message, you want to start with I. And then the goal is to give everyone the opportunity to share daily. So I know a lot of us do authors share, and that's um, you just don't want to do that on a daily basis. And the problem with the author's chair is that if you do the author's chair before it is truly finished and published, then um, it gives that student a sense of um, finality. If they 
everybody's already heard it. So the research has showed that they don't go back after office chair or the litigation lasts after office chair. So these shares are quick. They can take a minute, a minute, two minutes. They do not take long. And once you've taught the process, they can happen um, throughout. I was in the fourth grade room where they, I just taught um, leads or the introduction. And the students were starting to write independently after about 10 minutes. There was a hum in the room. And the teacher and I stopped to, oh, ooh, great. Are they, are they getting off task? What are they doing? So I all started to turn and talk to each other. So we just stopped and walked around. They were all talking about their leads. All of them were. So what we decided was this is a perfect time for a share. So we stopped with them share. Um, and then they went back to their writing. So that would be appropriate time. Just another moment, I mean, time is always the issue, but um, most of these were four minutes or less. Sarah's survey share was like two minutes and 10 seconds. I mean, it's really, um, and if we think about it that way, I think that might be some of us feel a little safer about saving that time at the end of the lesson for that closure with some type of a share. 